Okay, it's just 10 o'clock. We will go ahead and get started as people continue to come in. Hello, and thank you to everyone around the world for joining us for this week's lab meeting. My name is Kristen Abood. I am the science editor at the Human Vaccines Project, and I will be your moderator today. Earlier this week, the US government held a summit to discuss next generation COVID vaccines that could thwart both existing Omicron subvariants as well as future variants. The goal is to prioritize the development of new technologies, including intranasal vaccines that could stimulate mucosal immunity and hopefully help block transmission of SARS-CoV-2 and not just protect against the development of severe disease. This is a pressing priority as SARS-CoV-2 continues to spread, infect, and in many cases, reinfect people around the world. Meanwhile, researchers are also advancing their understanding of the immune system's response to SARS-CoV-2, a subject we will be hearing about today. Before we turn to today's presentation, I wanted to mention a new immunology prize. Through a partnership with AAAS and Science Magazine, Michelson Philanthropies is awarding a prize for immunology to early career investigators under the age of 35. A grand prize and two runner-up awards will be granted for transformative research that can accelerate vaccine and immunotherapy discovery. Applications will be accepted until October 1st. Please see our website and the link that we will be posting in the chat for more information or to apply. With that, it is my great pleasure to now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Judy Lieberman, Endowed Chair in Cellular and Molecular Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and a Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Lieberman's laboratory studies cytotoxic T lymphocytes and NK cells and their role in immune protection from infection and cancer, focusing on the molecular pathways used to kill both mammalian cells and microbes. Her lab was the first to describe CD8 T cell exhaustion in chronically infected HIV patients, which is the basis for current checkpoint blockade therapies for treating cancer. Her group also identified the mechanism behind inflammatory death or pyroptosis triggered by innate immune recognition of pathogens and the role this plays in both infection and cancer. Her recent work has identified important roles for pyroptosis in SARS-CoV-2, Yersinia, and group A streptococcal infection. Dr. Lieberman has also been at the forefront of developing RNAi-based therapeutics and using RNAi for genome-wide screening. Her lab was the first to show that siRNAs could be used to treat disease in vivo, which led them to develop cell-targeted RNAs that knock down gene expression in immune cells and cancer. During today's presentation, please send me your questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. I will ask our speaker a broad selection of your questions after the presentation, and we will have about 20 minutes for discussion. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Judy Lieberman. Thank you. Uh, let me um, share my screen. That's great. And I want to turn on my pointer. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm going to tell you a story that was just published in, in Nature from my lab and a companion um, manuscript published from the Flavel lab. And basically, we wanted to understand um, the molecular basis for severe COVID. And our, our underlying hypothesis was that um, since uh, severe COVID is an inflammatory process, that it might be mediated by activation of the immune sensors of invasive infection, inflammasomes, and the consequences of their activation, which is an inflammatory cell death called pyroptosis. 
Um, so basically the immune system has a challenge uh, at the surfaces of the body in the skin and uh, the mucosa, which is to distinguish the many uh, harmless uh, commensal microbes that live within and on our body uh, from uh, pathogens. And um, basically the, the immune function that does this is called innate immunity. And it's, uh, it operates on the skin and in, in the gastrointestinal tract, the lungs and the uh, urinary tract. And the innate immune system basically sounds the alarm for invasive infection, as well as for um, other signs of tissue damage or danger in the body. And the, this immune system recognizes uh, what we call strangers and dangers, uh, molecular patterns that are specific for pathogens like the uh, lipopolysaccharide on gram-negative bacteria, and those are called PAMPs, or danger-associated molecular patterns, which are host molecules that are often uh, in the wrong place, such as DNA in the cytosol of cells when it should be in the nucleus. And those uh, PAMPs and DAMPs are recognized by pattern recognition receptors. Um, and there are, there are many of them, hundreds of them actually, some on the surface of the cell or in endosomes. Uh, and the best known of those are called the toll-like receptors. And they, those receptors on the outside of the cell can't really distinguish the benign from pathogenic uh, infections. And they mostly work by priming uh, this, um, the epithelial or immune cells um, by upregulating gene expression. But within the cytosol of cells, there are sensors um, that can distinguish commensals from invasive path pathogens, either infections within the cell, like viruses or uh, bacteria that enter the cell, or molecules that are sent into cells by extracellular pathogens, like toxins. Um, and they, these sensors trigger a, a, a really potent immune alarm that's more potent than the, the sensors on the outside of the cell. And that alarm uh, both recruits immune cells to the site of infection or tissue damage and activates them. And it really sets the tone for the immune response to uh, pathogens. And probably the most inflammatory pathway in the body, which has only been understood in the last uh, five years or so, is our sensors called inflammasomes that activate this inflammatory or fiery cell death called pyroptosis, pyro meaning fire. And so py pyroptosis is, um, is mostly activated in immune sentinel cells like monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. And it's activated by cytosolic uh, pattern recognition receptors that assemble into very large micron size uh, molecular complexes called inflammasomes. And these inflammasomes, when they assemble, activate a family of inflammatory proteases called caspases. And the, the inflammatory caspases have two main substrates. They cleave um, a family of pore forming protein called gastermins. And in the immune um, sentinel cells and at the mucosa, that, that molecule is called gastermin D. And gastermin mean, is named after its location, gastrointestinal and uh, dermis skin. Um, and when the inflammatory caspases cleave gastermin D, they separate an N-terminal domain from an inhibitory C-terminal domain, and the N-terminal domain goes to the cell membrane, forms pores that um, 
basically uh, damage the perme permeabilize the membrane and kill the cell. And those pores are also conduits for secretion of inflammatory cytokines and other alarmants. In particular, the IL-1 family of, of inflammatory cytokines uh, don't have, which are the most potent um, uh, inflammatory cytokines in the body. They're responsible for example, for fever and for sepsis. Um, they don't have a secretion signal and therefore they, um, they, their secretion depends on these pores. There are actually five human gastermins, um, but the story today concerns gastermin D, which is the most well-studied, as well as the one that's where we encounter infection. So this alarm system is diagrammed in this slide. You have an, a sensor protein that recognizes a a PAMP or DAMP, a pathogen or host danger signal. And when, it, when the sensor um, is recognized, it recruits an adapter molecule called ASK and assembles into this very large uh, complex, which recruits the pro form of the inflammatory caspases. And within the inflammasome, uh, the inflammatory uh, caspases are activated to their mature form. And there are two main substrates that uh, they have. This pore forming protein called gastermin D, which is cleaved between the N-terminal domain in blue and the C-terminal domain in red. Uh, and the N-terminal domain goes to the cell surface and forms a very large pore. And uh, caspase one also cleaves the proforms of the IL-1 family cytokines. And once they're cleaved, they're active and can be uh, 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 recruited to the pore and uh, uh, secreted through the pore. So my lab got involved in, in uh, pyroptosis about five years ago when we, uh, identified how the gastermins function as pores. So here's a molecule of the full length gastermin D, N terminus here in red and the C terminus in green. And they're connected by this flex flexible linker, which makes it very susceptible to protease cleavage. Once it's cleaved, the N terminal domain binds to phospholipids but not all phospholipids. It only binds to phospholipids within the cell. It binds to acidic uh, uh, phospholipids uh, that are on the inner leaflet of the cell membrane, as well as the cardiolipin, which is on uh, the membranes of mitochondria and bacteria shown here. So the, end, the activated N-terminal domain binds, but the full length or C-terminal domain um, doesn't bind. And it turns out that uh, cardiolipin uh, uh, binding to bacteria uh, leads to killing of bacteria. And so the, the uh, stimulus of this pathway actually has a function in controlling uh, bacterial infection and also to mitochondria. And uh, we found, that, but this isn't published, that mitochondrial damage is a critical part of this cell death. In any event, uh, once these, this, these protein, the N-terminal gastermin binds to uh, the inner leaflet of the cell membrane, it assembles into very large membrane pores, which you can see here. Um, so the full length gastermin uh, doesn't do anything to membranes. The inflammatory caspase that cleaves it doesn't do anything, but together you can see these large pores, which are about uh, a couple hundred angstroms in inner diameter. Um, and uh, my collaborator, Hao Wu, recently solved the structure of this pore. Um, basically, it's made up of 33 subunits that form this large pre-pore structure. 
that has the structure of the uh, uncleaved end terminal domain. And then it, this, this um, end terminal domain undergoes a radical uh, shape change uh, transformation to form a pore in the membrane with these beta sheets that sort of dig into the membrane to form a large beta barrel. And, and basically what we found in this paper that was published last year is that the, the, the pore is covered by an acidic uh, uh, rim that may, means that the proforms of the IL-1 family cytokines, which are acidic on their outside, shown here in red, don't get passed through, don't get secreted, but the active forms of, of the cytokines do. And this is just the movie showing the shape change with these beta sheets that are forming the hole. And it's a very large pore, a couple hundred angstroms. So basically, um, I'm just giving you this background so you can understand my talk. Um, there, there, pyroptosis is, is are, there are two key events that are unleashed when these inflammasome sensors sense invasive infection. Uh, one is this fiery death formed by the pores and this dying cell um, produces these giant balloons of its cell membrane that are pathognomonic for inflammatory cell death. And also the processing and release of inflammatory cytokines, chemokines, and other inflammatory host proteins, which are called alarm, alarmins. Um, okay. And this process of pyroptosis and gastermin D in particular has shown to be critical for um, many human diseases, including sepsis, uh, which has many features that overlap with severe uh, COVID-19 disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, um, arthritis, and Alzheimer's disease. And the sense, there are many sensors, um, what we call inflammasomes, that can sense things like bacterial toxins, crystals like cholesterol crystals and atherosclerosis, uh, bacterial products like the needle rod or flagellum that are injected into cells by a secretion system, um, as well as uh, uh, microbial and viral uh, DNA and RNA. Um, in addition, there's a, another uh, sort of a, a side system that is specifically devoted to recognizing LPS, and that's called the non-canonical inflammasome. So uh, when we started this, it was known that severe COVID uh, disease is, is, is linked to cytokine storm. But there are many inflammatory pathways that have been described, but uh, our hunch, uh, since sepsis is caused by pyroptosis uh, and overlaps with co severe COVID disease, that was that perhaps inflammasome activation and pyroptosis might be an important factor in severe COVID. And if that were true, we'd like to, we wanted to understand how was the, how was this uh, inflammatory pathway induced by the SARS-CoV-2 virus and in what cells was it induced. So basically, if you look at this disease course of mild COVID versus severe COVID, um, basically after three to five days after infection, um, uh, uh, infected people develop symptoms. Uh, in mild disease, the virus actually peaks uh, before the onset of symptoms and uh, uh, resolves within about a week to 10 days. There's inflammation associated with acute infection, but it resolves. In severe COVID, the viral loads aren't any higher than in mild COVID, but what happens is that the... Uh, virus persists for longer and the inflam inflammatory um, uh, complications are much more exaggerated. 
and uh, patients progress from sort of mild symptoms to uh, uh, pneumonia, shortness of breath, and hypoxia. And then uh, in a rare, in rare, uh, but a large number of patients go on to develop a systemic disease that's characterized by um, uh, uh, cytokine storm, acute respiratory distress, um, vascular leakage, and multi-coagulation, hypercoagulation, and uh, multi-organ failure. And so this is what we wanted to understand, what distinguishes these patients from those. And so why did we think that um, pyroptosis might be responsible? First of all, the comorbidities and age are, are associated with increased basal levels of uh, this pathway of inflammasome activation and inflammation, and it's called inflammation inflammaging. Um, second, um, the disease occurs um, a couple of weeks after infection and is not linked to viral load. And it was known when we started this project that plasma signs of inflammation, all kinds of signs of inflammation, not just pyroptosis, correlated strongly with development of severe disease. And those included the IL-1 family cytokines, which whose releases and processing is dependent on this pathway. Um, and because the clinical features of severe COVID overlap with, with sepsis, and that depends on inflammasome activation, gastrin D, we thought it was uh, there was a good chance that severe COVID might be linked to pyroptosis. So um, this is, these are the people who, who did the work I'm, I'm going to tell you about, uh, Caroline and Angela in my lab and Shaheen and my colleague in Goldfeld's lab. But this was a, a really community effort and required many people to provide us with uh, clinical samples, antibodies, um, uh, to work in the BL3 lab, et cetera. So we started the study by uh, looking at um, fresh uh, blood cells from people who presented to the MGH emergency room with uh, respiratory symptoms. Um, and we had to use fresh blood for this, uh, which I think is why other studies may, have not, may not have uh, figured this out, because if you freeze blood cells and then thaw them. The cells that are dying, which pyroptosis is a kind of programmed cell death, um, will not survive freeze thawing and you, you won't detect them. So we started by looking at uh, peripheral blood mononuclear cells, either from healthy donors, HD, or from um, the patients who had confirmed COVID-19 infection. And we stain them with a dye called zombie yellow that only enters cells that are dying, um, not cells with an intact cell membrane, and an X and 5, which is a sign of uh, classical uh, apoptotic cell death. And what we found was that in the monocytes of COVID patients, an increased number of cells that were zombie yellow positive, but an X and negative. So they were undergoing um, inflammatory cell death, um, but none of the lymphocyte populations had increased in cell death. And that's just quantified here. So on average, uh, maybe uh, a somewhat more than about 6% of the uh, monocytes in the blood of patients who were infected with COVID of any uh, disease stage um, uh, were undergoing this inflammatory cell death. Then we looked in the plasma to see if uh, there could be signs that are specific for pyroptosis. 
So during pyroptosis, get the N-terminal fragment of gastermin D is released. That was elevated in the plasma of the COVID patients compared to healthy donors, as was LDH, which is pathognomonic for inflammatory cell death, including pyroptosis. IL-1 beta, the IL-1 receptor antagonist, which is induced and often uses a surrogate for IL-1 and IL-18. So these are all uh, specific for pyroptosis and they were highly elevated and they were more elevated in, in patients with moderate or severe disease, especially severe disease, um, at, compared to either healthy donors or patients with, who developed only mild disease. And then we wanted to know, so if there's pyroptosis going on, is there any sign in the blood of, and the monocytes were dying, could they um, have activated inflammasomes? So to do that, I'll refer you again to this cartoon. We stain cells for the adapter that assembles into the, in the inflammasome and uh, activated caspase one. Uh, and we compared uh, monocytes from healthy donors with COVID-19 patients. And remember I told you these inflammasomes are giant uh, multi-molecular complexes of they're about a micron in size. They're very easy to see. Um, in uh, cells that are undergoing this inf inflammatory process. So in healthy donors, we didn't see um, any ASC specs. We didn't see specs of activated caspase one, which is um, measured here by a, an activation assay. Um, and what we saw in the cells that had inflammasome and uh, activation was these characteristic membrane bubbles that are uh, characteristic of pyroptosis. And this is just quantified here. In the patients who came to the ER with other uh, respiratory diseases that looked like they might have COVID but were COVID-19, they had some evidence of inflammasome activation, but it was uh, significantly reduced compared to the COVID patients here. And to, to see whether these inflammasomes were leading to pyroptosis, we also stain for gastermin D and for the, with this dye that indicates the cell membrane has been permeabilized. And what you can see is that gastermin D is distributed throughout the cell um, in the healthy donors, and there's no ASC specs. But in the COVID patients, the gastermin forms these puncta on the membrane. And then if you look here uh, at the zombie dye, you can see like the morphology is really um, abnormal and you get these balloons of the cell membrane and the balloons are where we see these uh, puncta of the membrane pore forming protein. So then we wanted to know which inflammasomes uh, might be activated and we, NLRP3 is an inflammasome that, uh, that gets activated in response to membrane damage. And we saw the, uh, uh, NLRP3 uh, specs that co-localize with the ASC specs only in the COVID-19 patients. AIM2 is an inflammasome which we didn't expect to see activated, but was, um, which senses uh, DNA in the cytosol. And we found specs that have AIM2 with ASC. And uh, not all inflammasomes were activated. Pyrin, which recognizes bacterial toxins, uh, was not activated. And the, the inflammasomes that had the ASC, NLRP3, and AIM2 all co-localized. And um, virtually every cell that had an ASC spec had activation of caspase 1, AIM2, and NLRP3, but not the bacterial sensor. So, so next we wanted to know what was activating um, 
these inflammasomes and monocytes. So uh, mostly people didn't think that monocytes could be infected with the SARS virus because it doesn't have the ACE2 receptor. But we thought, well, these inflammasomes recognize invasive infection, um, perhaps they're infected. So we stained the blood from healthy donors and COVID patients with for nu the SARS nucleocapsid N, and for uh, with an antibody J2 that recognizes uh, double-stranded RNA, which is produced in cells that are uh, replicating uh, SARS-CoV-2. And what we found was that basically all the cells that had aspects stained for nucleocapsid, um, and they also stained for J2, which indicated that the monocytes weren't only taking up the virus, which you would, would give you nucleocapsid staining, but they were actually beginning to replicate the virus because they stained for J2. And basically, if we looked at we didn't see any sign of infection in the healthy donors. About 10% uh, of the monocytes in, in this group uh, of patients uh, were infected, which is actually a very large number. Um, and the same percentage were uh, staying for J2. So basically the virus isn't just being taken up, it's also beginning to replicate. And then, in the infected cells that were N positive or J2 positive, um, more than 80% of them uh, had ASK specs. And of the cells with ASK specs, um, 90 plus percent of them uh, were infected. Then we looked in autopsies of uh, uh, patients who died from either trauma or uh, COVID-19 and stained them for uh, nucleocapsid and green to identify infected cells, uh, ASK to identify inflammasomes, and CD14 to uh, identify tissue macrophages. And what we found was um, there were infection of both uh, epithelial and endothelial cells in the lung, but they didn't have any ASK specs and didn't stain for um, CD14. But the cells that, uh, that stain for CD14 actually also had ASK specs, and that's quantified in the next slide. So in the CD14 positive macrophages in the lung, we found that about 8% uh, or so of the um, macrophages in the COVID-19 patients, none in the control trauma patients, um, had, were infected. But actually, a quarter of all the tissue macrophages had uh, inflammasome specs and were undergoing pyroptosis. So these macrophages, which are not infected, we think may be activating uh, inflammasomes that recognize tissue damage. And you know, in lungs that are uh, have pneumonia. Um, and then, if we looked at the uh, uh, epithelial and then the thelial cells that were infected, we found that about fifteen percent uh, were infected, um, which is about twice the rate of the macrophages. Um, but none of those had any any ASK specs that we could detect. And we're not sure why inflammasomes were being activated in the lung cells. So why, how did they, these monocytes get infected if they don't um, express ACE2? Do they replicate the virus? We think we thought probably because they had double-stranded RNA and do they produce infectious virions? So to, to try to figure it out, we first looked uh, more carefully at the monocytes of the COVID patients um, to see which monocytes get infected. So you can classify uh, monocytes in the blood by their expression for CD14 and CD16, which is an FC receptor uh, 
that recognizes uh, antibodies. And in this is just the distribution of the, the classical monocytes in the blood are CD14 high and CD16 negative. And you can see those are reduced in the COVID patients that, that was previously reported. And there's an increase in non-classical uh, 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 monocytes that express CD16. And then when we stain for uh, nucleocapsid, we found that this, the classical monocytes, which are most of the monocytes in the blood, were not infected. But these uh, non-classical populations of intermediate and uh, non-classical monocytes that expressed CD16, about, over, about a half of them were infected. So this infection is, is, depends on CD16. Um, and that, so we wanted to look at, at see if whether we could infect healthy donor monocytes with, with the, the SARS virus and what it would take. Um, so we took healthy donor monocytes and infected them with a molecular clone that expresses neon green, a fluorescent marker of viral replication. Um, and the infect. We, we performed the infection on monocytes that were either fresh or were activated with LPS uh, because we thought that that might enhance infection. Um, and uh, in the presence of either patient plasma or monoclonal antibodies that recognize the spike protein or a control antibody. And what we found is that um, healthy donor monocytes uh, could become infected. Um, they, the infected cells uh, express neon green, so they were actively replicating the virus since this was a reporter of replication, but that the infection required some source of antibody, which made sense since uh, CD16, the uh, the receptor expressed on infected cells is a receptor for antibody. So the, these healthy donor monocytes were incubated with, um, with, uh, with a irrelevant monoclonal anti-SARS um, uh, monoclonals or patient plasma. And patient plasma was the most efficient at inducing infection. And this infection was antibody mediated because if we depleted um, antibodies from the plasma using protein A, G beads, uh, we practically abrogated infection. And in these healthy donors, uh, basically uh, all the cells that were infected that were nucleocapsid positive had ASC specs. So here we're just looking at the infected cells in these populations. And you can see that here uh, in blue. So then we wanted to see uh, what receptor was responsible for infection. And we used blocking antibodies to CD16, um, to other FC receptors, CD32 and CD64, which are expressed pretty much on all the monocytes in the blood, even the one, you know, the cl classical monocytes, um, and to ACE2. Um, and we found that the infection here measured by the neon green reporter uh, was blocked by anti-CD16 or anti-CD32. Um, um, and it was also, uh, blocked if we depleted IgG, but not IgA uh, from the plasma. So this suggested that FC receptors CD16 and or CD64 um, were uh, the receptors for viral uptake. We don't think it's CD64, um, but because CD64 and CD16 associate with each other on the cell membrane, blocking CD64 may block CD16. So then, you know, we were concerned about uh, 
what about um, people who were vaccinated? Uh, with the antibodies raised by uh, SARS vac vaccines uh, promote infection. So we compared uh, infection of healthy donor monocytes uh, with um, in the presence of either healthy donor plasma, the plasma from uh, people who've been vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine, and their anti-spike titers were twice as high as the ones of the patients um, that we saw in the emergency room whose plasma we used. So we compared healthy donor plasma, uh, vaccinated uh, healthy donor plasma, uh, patients who presented to the ER, the, the plasma patients who presented with respiratory disease that was not COVID, and uh, different pools of COVID-19 plasma um, from pa all pa comers or patients with mild or severe disease. And what we found, uh, fortunately, was that the pool plasma from the healthy donors who had been boosted a week prior did not facilitate infection. There was some activity in the plasma of the patients with non-COVID-19. Um, and in this small study of a few patients, we didn't identify a difference in uh, monocyte infection according to ultimate disease stage. Um, we next wanted to know, uh, does, does we, I showed you evidence that the virus begins to replicate by both J2 staining and the um, neon green reporter, um, but we wanted to you know, really verify that. So we looked at during viral replication, the virus makes a number of subgenomic uh, mRNAs. And we found that in the healthy donor monocyte infection, we could detect um, those subgenomic RNAs. So that really indicates that, that, you know, pretty definitively that the virus isn't just taken up into monocytes, but is uh, beginning to replicate. But then when we looked at whether uh, these healthy donor monocytes uh, produced infectious uh, virions, um, we looked two days after infection, we did not detect any plaque forming units, any evidence of infectious virions in culture supernatant. So what we think is that um, pyroptosis uh, is a very rapid kind of cell death. The viral life cycle takes at least 12 hours to produce infectious spirions, but that pyroptosis probably occurs way before that and interferes with um, the ability of the virus to uh, complete its life cycle. Um, I, I, I just want to quickly sh share with you um, a few other slides uh, so we have some time for discussion. Um, in this slide, um, in the companion paper um, led by Essen Sethic and uh, Richard Flavel's lab, he looked at uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in a very good mouse, humanized mouse model. This model, um, uh, uses mice that express a number of cytokines that increase engraftment, especially of myeloid cells. Um, and then the mice are um, injected uh, in the lung to, to express human ACE2. And, uh, and they're uh, transplanted with human um, uh, uh, bone marrow um, to engraft a human immune system. So this model it turns out, which was published in Nature Biotech at the end of 2021, is very well, they mice develop uh, pneumonia and severe COVID disease, and they, they very closely reproduce the effects, the re responses of humans to different immune interventions. So uh, in this model, uh, uh, Essen found that there were elevated um, 
uh, IL-1 family cytokines and gas thermin D. So these are specific markers of uh, pyroptosis, either at four days or 14 days post-infection. And uh, we helped them look at the whether there were inflammasomes in these um, uh, COVID-infected uh, 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 macrophages in, in the lung and found that we could detect aspects in, in monocytes and only in the human monocytes uh, and uh, NLRP3 inflammasomes. So basically in this lung model, um, we had pyroptosis in uh, myeloid cells. And what the mouse allowed us to do was to look and see whether um, pyroptosis and inflammasome activation are important in lung pathology. So uh, in this, the mice were infected, were infected on day zero, and they were given uh, about a week uh, later, a week to two weeks later, they were given either an inhibitor of the inflammatory caspase, caspase one, which is the uh, caspase activated by the, the inflammasomes that I showed you, or an inhibitor of NLRP3, which is one of the activated inflammasomes. And you can, if you look at the lungs, you can see this dense inflammatory infiltrate um, and pneumonia in the control mice, but the mice that were treated with the, to inhibit um, inflammasome activation had remarkably uh, less lung pathology, which is quantified here. So um, basically I wanna summarize, um, we found that patients with severe COVID-19 have evidence for uh, inflammasome activation and IL-1 cytokines in their blood. Uh, monocytes become infected even though they don't have ACE2. The infected monocytes and macrophages don't produce infectious virions, probably because uh, pyroptosis interferes, kills the cell before it has a chance to finish replicating the virus. That infection depends on antibodies and most likely CD16, but not all antibodies mediate infection. And we can discuss what we think is going on, uh, which what's the characteristic of antibodies that do. But fortunately, the antibodies from vaccines uh, did not. Um, we don't understand. So only the mon infected uh, monocytes and macrophages had evidence of pyroptosis, not the lung epithelial and endothelial cells. We don't understand why. And basically about 6% of the blood monocytes were infected at any time. That's about 100 million cells. And 25% of the tissue mac lung macrophages had this inf inflammatory death going out. And so that's an incredible burden of cells that are dying and spewing out all these inflammatory mediators. Um, and in the mouse model, it, our data suggests that that's a, a critical um, element in, uh, in lung um, this, um, pathology. Um, so um, I think one of the implications is that inhibiting uh, inflammatory cell death might um, prevent severe COVID um, and that pyroptosis we think is really a double-edged sword. It aborts, product, it takes up the virus, aborts production of infectious virions uh, and stimulates uh, protective immunity by, by sending out chemokines and other uh, cytokines that recruit immune cells to the site of damage, but it's also um, can be dangerous and trigger lethal inflammation. And these are just all the people that did the work. It was like an amazing uh, collaboration as a lot of COVID research has been, people have really come together. <laughs>
and uh, to try to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman, for that very clear and intriguing presentation. Um, thanks so much. We have, as you might have guessed, and I think you did from your summary, we have several questions coming in on the role of the antibodies in, in triggering the infection of the monocytes. So I'll try to summarize a little bit of the questions that are being um, asked, and then maybe you can talk about some of the, the theories for, for that. Um, so one is, do you think isotype versus specificities for different regions of the virus could play a role? Um, can anti-S antibodies mediate infection of monocytes without that happening from the vaccine? Does that suggest that it's the post-fusion structure that mediates infection? And maybe elaborating on which classes types of antibodies promote the SARS-CoV-2 uptake into healthy monocytes? Um, and is it epitope specificity or subclass or a combination? We'll start there. Uh, okay, so uh, we in our paper, we presented some evidence for a theory, which I'm going to tell you. Um, and the truth is, we, I think we still need to do some more work. But other groups, uh, uh, Taya Wong at Stanford and a group in the Netherlands, whose name I forget, um, have shown that severe COVID is linked to a, a post-translational modification of antibodies. So it's not, it's not the specificity. It has not that we showed like both neutralizing and non-neutralizing antibodies did it. It's not, we don't think it has anything to do with the subtype. You know, um, we used IgG1 mostly in our studies. Um, which I didn't show you um, because that's the main antibody subclass. But th these other papers have suggested that SARS, acute SARS infection causes the production of uh, antibodies that are, that are lacking fucose in their uh, FC, fucose modifications of their FC re region. And those groups have linked severe COVID to a uh, production of afucosylated antibodies. And in, in our, but they didn't know why having afucosylated antibodies could um, cause severe disease. But it turns out that CD16, the receptor that we think is important for uptake on monocytes and macrophage, macrophage is actually, um, also express ACE2, and they can take up the virus either by ACE2 or by CD16. But the affinity of CD16 for antibodies is about 10 times greater for antibodies that don't have fucose. They, these afucosylated antibodies that are increased in acute um, SARS infection and linked to development of severe disease. So what we think is that these high and these antibodies, afucosylated antibodies, are apparently not highly produced during um, vaccination. Okay. So, so yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so people don't really understand what regulates the production of afucosylated antibodies versus regular an antibodies. There's some studies that suggest that envelope viruses generate afucosylated antibodies during the acute infection, but then they become fucosylated as the infection becomes chronic. So because the uptake, um, and we did show in our paper that the we, we got from Taya um, plasma from patients that had higher levels of afucosylated antibodies or not. And the only the plasma that had high amounts of apucosylated antibodies um, promoted the infection of healthy donor um, monocytes. Interesting. And so does that play into why the plasma from both mild and severe COVID patients similarly mediated infection of monocytes? Well, yeah, so, uh, so it's, it's the only, until uh, last week, a paper, <laughs> 
um, showed that uh, ELISA uh, method for measuring, for quantifying afucosylated antibodies, you had to like do mass spec to, um, to figure out how much afucosylated antibodies there were. And so, um, and there wasn't a way to really purify those antibodies. Right. So that made it really hard to look at it more carefully. But, but, um, but now there's an ELISA, so presumably there are, there, there are antibodies which we're trying to get that can detect selectively afucosylated uh, uh, right. antibodies. And could, could you hypothesize that this might be why convalescent plasma therapy overall failed? Yeah, so, you know, uh, basically, if you look at all that, both the convalescent plasma and the, um, even the therapy, the monoclonal antibody um, therapies, passive immunization, the results are really, you know, it took a long time before any clinical trial with therapeutic antibodies showed efficacy. And it all, they, they're only effective if they're given uh, early. And so what, what I think is that, you know, neutralizing antibodies are fabulously protective, um, but um, the other, this uh, FC receptor dependent function of antibodies um, is, could be really important in, in inflammation. So it's, it's like a balance between neutralization activity and what, what we're describing, which is antibody-dependent infection. Um, and you know, one worry I have is that um, as the neutralizing activity of our vaccines has declined, you know, and we're seeing more breakthrough infections that some of this, uh, this antibody dependent toxicity might become more important that it's like a balance. So if you have great neutralization, you can probably ignore uh, the inflammation, but if you don't, then think these things might be, uh, this, this inflammatory side effect might be important. Uh, and, um, you know, that's sort of what I'm worried about because when I look at the maps of where, you know, breakthrough infections, they've actually been higher in, in states that have higher vaccination rates or, you know, with the Om Omicron and variant surges that it's been more in states and countries that have higher vaccination rates. So that has worried me a lot that, that maybe as we're losing neutralization, where the, these other, this other property of the antibodies is becoming more important. So I think it's important for therapeutic vaccines to look, you know, to really look at what properties of the constant region, not only of the um, what antigen and what um, affinity the antibody has for for the spike protein, but these other this other property could become important. Wow, that's that's both um, very intriguing and and quite frightening. But... <laughs> well, I I I was relieved that at least in our first experiments that the vaccine you know was not vaccine plasma wasn't very efficient Absolutely. at generating um, yeah. infection. So, I mean, I think that's really reassuring, but I think we really have to study more uh, these other antibody functions. Right, right, right. Which we, which we talk about all the time, but uh, usually for the benefits of them, right? <laughs> In this case, it's- Right, like some of the, like um, some of the companies were actually trying to, make antibodies that bind better to, by their FC receptor to say CD16, and that might not be a good idea. Right, right, <laughs> exactly.
Well, uh, thank you so much. I think we could probably keep you for another hour just to talk through the rest of these questions, but unfortunately we're, we're at the end of the session. So thank you so much, Dr. Lieberman, for presenting on this really important area of research. And we just really appreciate you taking the time to share your information and for answering questions from our audience. Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And thank you to all the attendees for participating in today's webinar and for submitting such ex excellent questions for our speaker. And if you're interested in more research on COVID-19, please do sign up for the HVP COVID report, a newsletter providing insights from experts around the globe and highlighting the latest scientific articles and data. And finally, just please visit our website and follow us on LinkedIn where the full webinar series is available. The Global COVID Lab meeting will be on holiday in August, but we will return in September with an exciting lineup of speakers. So please do check the website for more information and watch for updates in your email. And with that, I'll say thank you again for participating, stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you all again when the Global COVID Lab meeting returns in September. Thank you so much.